Well, thanks again for coming. Uh, thanks to Phil Stevens and Kevin Carroll for inviting me to put together this session. Uh, I, they said, run, run two, two classes for us here. And so I picked stuff that's interesting to me and, and things that I'm very unsure about so that I could learn through the process of putting the class together. Um, so here's an idea of what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of theoretical uh, research. Then we've invited uh, the various uh, providers, manufacturers of the uh, prosthetic uh, microprocessor controlled feet to, uh, to come in and talk about their products and their data. And then we're going to uh, present a short clinical research project at the end that will uh, possibly be a model for you to, to join in your own practices. Um, I, there, there's a lot to this topic. It's, this is obviously an area that's growing. There's a little overlap here between microprocessor control and powered uh, feet because they also have microprocessor control. But I think this will, uh, will give you a good overview. Uh, the, the schedule did change dramatically from what you see in your original program because we had some sickness and some, some cancellations. Uh, so I appreciate all the speakers who are, are stepping up and, and helping out with the class today. Um, I asked each of the manufacturers to submit um, to me a uh, data sheet, more or less, about their products. Um, I asked for all these different um, specifications about the feet, size, range, weight, weight limit, battery life, build height, uh, range of motion, what, what actual data they're collecting from their microprocessors, uh, what the passive and active functions are, uh, how much heel height adjustability they can get from it, is it water resistant, what's the warranty, what are the service intervals, um, what are the functions that are adjustable by the user, um, what are any special functions that it has, what are contraindications and limitations, and what are the suggested procedure codes. Uh, I might add, as, as I was going through this, uh, I probably will add 19, which is, is there a trial period for the, for the foot? Anyway, I don't have all the data back right now, but we are going to post it on the uh, Lower Limb Society website. If everyone wants to write this down, um, this is a great uh, resource that we have. Uh, we just formed a new group on that website called the uh, Microprocessor Controlled Foot Group. That's where I'm going to post this information. And um, we'd love to have you folks join the Lower Limb Society, but you don't have to be a member to go to this website and to use the resources on it. We also have a pediatric group. We have a post-op group. So uh, it, it's a tremendous resource. All the societies have these uh, Ning sites. Um, and if you go to the main academy site, they, they can get you to the individual sites. But uh, I encourage you to go there. We'll get all this data down, and then I think it'll be a great comparison. Because um, the idea really is to uh, pick the most appropriate foot for your patient and, and make it work for them. At the end of the day, I think we also have to be really careful in our documentation um, about why we're doing this, justifying it, and making sure that it's well documented. Um, this is not a, a foot that should just go on everyone, and I think it'll kind of uh, spoil what, what is being accomplished and what could be accomplished with this if, the, if careful thought isn't used to, to who these are put on, uh, especially because of the, the higher cost. So I would encourage everyone to, to really carefully justify <clears throat> what they're doing and what activities this is going to benefit um, the patient. What, what is this going to allow them to do that they couldn't do before? That should be carefully documented in your notes. Okay, we're going to bring up uh, Jason Wilkins, and give him a warm welcome, please. Hello, my name is Jason Wilkins. I'm the director of the Military Performance Lab at uh, the Center for the Intrepid, which is at Brook Army Medical Center. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come here and speak. Um, I have a few qualifiers that you'll see in a minute, and one is that I'm a physical therapist and have a PhD in biomechanics, and so I'm not a prosthetist, but I appreciate the opportunity to come and share some of the information that we've gathered over the years. Um, I have no disclosures to make. Um, my views are my own and not representative of other groups. Um, but this 
question of most appropriate device is a very loaded question. And, and uh, typically what you see is you encounter that question um, when there's not enough data to make a definitive decision. Um, and, and so it's very challenging. In this case, it's a complex question and there's uh, very significant consequences. Uh, the, the comment about the sequester, there are significant financial implications uh, associated with clinical uh, practice and care and reimbursement. But there's also, most importantly, functional consequences. We want to allow our patients to re achieve the highest level of physical function and uh, having data to support that decision making process uh, is very important. When I was asking, uh, kind of asking around in preparation for this talk, you get some different types of answers in terms of selecting the most appropriate type of device. Um, it's a, a phenomenon that you encounter whether you're arguing over surgical techniques, physical therapy techniques, or clinical practice uh, in, in the prosthetics realm. And I, I broke it down into three main areas. One, you have the advocates. You have people who have found the solution and they're going to apply the solution widespread. Um, we have some industry uh, represented in this session, and it's logical for them to advocate. They've invested significant time and effort and they believe that their device is the best. Um, uh, they have the anecdotal um, types of responses. I have a patient who, I, who looked like this and I used this device and I had great success. Uh, you may have somebody who had that exact same um, type of patient description and they had a success with a different type of, of uh, device. Uh, it gets very difficult to weed those out. And then uh, apprehensive may not be the most appropriate word, but it's a more nuanced response. It's weighing the pros and cons of the different options and that's what I'm hoping to present here today is uh, just some of the information that you can use to feed into your clinical decision making process. As I said, I have a few qualifiers. Um, over the past few years, I've been at the Center for the Intrepid and had the opportunity to work with an amazing patient population and do objective assessments of these different devices, or at least a few of them. Um, but our, our perspective may be a bit skewed and may not necessarily fit with what you see on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it's a generally young, active patient population, and they have access to care that uh, isn't commonly available outside of the, the military setting in terms of intensity of rehabilitation uh, and, and frequency of and access to care. Um, as the director of a biomechanics lab, we have a whole slew of tools available to us. We can use tools from comprehensive um, biomechanical assessments to digital video fluoroscopy to looking at muscle activation. Um, and so we have all these tools in our toolbox and have worked to establish the reliability of them. Um, but at the end of the day, even though our clinicians have the access to all of those tools, at the end, the decision comes down to the patient feedback, patient expectations, and clinical experience. And so really, all the data that I'm presenting here today is just another piece of the puzzle uh, to help in that decision-making process. Um, John Ferguson uh, used this in a presentation just recently, and I borrowed it from him. Um, our perspective on what advanced technology is evolves over the year and what may be the latest and greatest now um, may be old news uh, a few years down the road. Uh, but what we keep in mind when we're applying these technologies is that our patients, one of the biggest factors in terms of the, the level of function they achieve is that patient's motivation, their physical condition, um, and we're just along the way to, to help them reach those goals. Um, John used this uh, particular slide because we have a patient who also is a bilateral bilateral transtibial amputee and uh, likes to play basketball and I don't know if we could argue that with the current technology his vertical jumps any higher now than it was than it would be if you were wearing technology like this. Uh, we've been very fortunate in our facility to um, be involved with the kind of the cutting edge technology. Uh, some people joke about it being bleeding edge technology um, because it, there's some bump fits and starts as you get going with it. Um, but we've, some of the data that was collected in our lab actually went into the controller for the, the Sparky device you see in the, the top left corner. Um, back in 2006, we had patients going up and down the stairs in the Proprio device. And uh, as you'll see here shortly, we've done uh, a lot, quite a bit of objective assessment with the, the biome device, we've also uh, tested many individuals using the proprio. And so I want to just quick repeat the poll, um, basically with a little more specificity in it. Um, can you raise your hand if you have experience with the proprio device specifically? So that's good, I can cut down that part. Um, can you raise your hand if you have experience with the biome, if you've used that? And so we do have quite a few people who have gone through and fit the biome. And then can I have you raise your hand if you've worked with any other type of uh, microprocessor device? And so a handful there also. All right, thank you. Uh, we hear a lot of talk about biomimetic systems, and that picture on the top right is not a biomimetic system. You come up with a solution to an enhance function that is completely different than the, it, the normal biology. Um, but what you see is a trend with a lot of the devices you'll see here today is that effort to essentially mimic the function of the intact foot and ankle system to restore physical function, uh, but there are many different ways, as you'll see, of getting there. 
Uh, in terms of our, our clinical experience and how we discuss it uh, specifically within the lab is that we've kind of looked at it in terms of the microprocessor ankle and then the power devices as well, was alluded to before. Uh, the microprocessor ankle, in this case the proprio, pre-positions the foot. Um, it has a dorsiflexion during swing to help with toe clearance, um, but it doesn't provide the active push-off. Um, there's concerns or maybe need to be taken into consideration that you have, because you have a low profile foot, it may alter energy storage and return. Um, and in our experience, there's things like uh, taking multiple strides to recognize condition. And then the things that come along with more advanced technology is typically the size and the weight. Um, I put durability down there um, because our patients are very good at breaking things, running it through sand, through water, anything you can think of, our patients have probably tried to do it. Um, Durability was a question on the proprio. We actually had a, a patient in the lab uh, right before testing. He, I think he was trying to break it and he was bouncing on it. And he actually snapped the carbon fiber foot before the proprio broke. So um, our patients do break devices. Um, in this case, at least uh, the device held up in, in that case. And then we have the power devices and you'll hear more about it when the, the manufacturers uh, go through. Um, but we talk about these power devices where they have activi activity recognition that may be slightly more nuanced. Um, you have, they're controlled by uh, factors such as tibial orientation, loading. Uh, you get push off by powers and motors, or push off power through motors and combination of springs. Uh, they can be potentially infinitely tunable. Um, you have a lot of control there. And they have what we could consider to be a true ankle motion. They have an ankle axis of rotation and the foot rotates about that. Um, but you have, again, the, some of the downsides of these technologies in terms of cost, battery life, uh, weight and noise. Um, I, I, some of the microprocessor and power devices I don't think you'd want to have if you were a librarian or, or worked in a movie theater. Uh, there's just some of these things that go along with the technology. Um, so in the mil military, you have uh, the bluff, the bottom line up front. So what I'm going to give you, if you don't listen to a single other thing, this is some of the, the considerations that we have here. Um, when prescribing uh, patients some of these devices, um, activity type is an important consideration. Um, and I have a whole series of anecdotes that I could share in terms of, I know this patient who uh, was a mother of two, she has a lot of stairs in her house, and so she liked the proprio device because it helped her go up and down stairs. Um, but activity, activity type and the frequency is very important consideration, uh, particularly also when you get into things like prolonged walking and metabolic cost. Um, and then agility type activities, whether or not the device can handle high level activity. Um, that goes right along with the maximum load loud. Uh, some of the manufacturers will share their specifications and kind of maybe give you an idea of what is possible with their particular system. Uh, the durability questions. Uh, one thing that I'm going to touch briefly on is socket fit and suspension. You have all this added mass distally, and we've actually had some interesting comments in terms of how different devices maybe relate to that, that socket fit and suspension, also as well as limb health. Um, patient's willingness to work with technology is a big consideration. Uh, we had one patient say, I hate having to charge my cell phone, why would I want to charge my leg? And, and so you go through this on a day-to-day -day basis when you sit down uh, with your patient, you take these many factors into consideration. Uh, we have a, a couple of unique things, maybe not so unique, maybe, well, potentially unique to Texas. Uh, we had patients reject devices because they wouldn't fit in their cowboy boots. Um, they couldn't wear skinny jeans with them. That was a, an interesting one, um, as well as uh, the ability to put them in dress shoes. And so if you're transitioning between different sh uh, shoe types, a uh, microprocessor ankle can potentially be beneficial. And so I'm going to start off with just a little uh, quick synopsis of some of the literature on the, the proprio device. Um, and first, I just want to start off with some of the evidence out of the group from Heidelberg, uh, where they did a study to test the effects of this dorsiflexion and plantar flexion adaptation on the kinematics and kinetics during stair ascent and descent. Uh, they tested individuals with unilateral transtibial amputation, healthy match controls, and they didn't test the proprio device versus another device. They actually looked at the functionality of adaptive ankle motion, which I think is an important consideration. Uh, a lot of the studies, in, in my mind, should be focusing on where's the biggest bang for the buck? Where do we want to, what type of functionality is most important rather than is device A better than device B. And so in that case, they tested it with the ankle locked in place as well as with the adaptive motion. And um, as a biomechanist, I fought the urge uh, at the recommendation of others to put up a whole slew of biomechanics graphs. And so I'm going to give you the, the bullet points uh, on the, the slides and the different studies here. Uh, I think a lot of people appreciate that. Um, the, the initial question we had it, uh, kind of from a clinical perspective is does the device operate as expected. And yes, the proprio device appropriately prepositions during uh, stair ambulation. Um, it does what it says it should. 
um, in terms of comparing the adaptive ankle motion with um, the fixed ankle, um, we saw reduced compensations during stair ascent. And so uh, individuals with transtibular amputation tend to adopt what's called a hip strategy. Rather than uh, due to an inability to get the knee out over the foot to engage the quadriceps, they typically rely on their uh, hip extensors to generate that power to lift up to the next step. What they saw in the proprio device is that they saw that increased knee flexion indicating that the foot, that the knee was out further over the foot. Uh, we saw the increased knee extensor torque and power so that they were able to use their quads to help lift up. And it also decreased the hip power, decreased the compensation you typically see. And you also saw uh, slightly reduced compensations during descent. Um, so we have some initial evidence that both during uh, stair ascent and stair descent, the adaptive ankle motion helped. It didn't fully correct or eliminate the deviations, uh, but it helped bring them back to a more normal gait pattern. And so uh, the, there'll be lots of arguments maybe over what, how you define function, but in terms of how we're dealing with it in this presentation, we did see, yes, a more normal stair ambulation during ascent and descent. Uh, we have similar data from the same group on slopes. And so the purpose of this was very similar. They had individuals uh, do slope ascent and descent. Uh, they used the, the same patient cohort, um, again, with appropriate ankle fixed and with the adaptive motion. And once again, the device did what it was supposed to do. Um, one of the challenges that we've seen, we actually conducted, we got partway through a biomechanical study in the proprio device um, that's actually very similar along these lines, um, but we found that the adaptive motion sometimes took a very long time on sloped surfaces with the proprio device. You get a more rapid response on stairs. And so we actually weren't able to do that testing on sloped surfaces because of the time that it took for the device to adapt at that point. Um, in terms of how the device compared with a fixed ankle, on the slopes we saw reduced compensations during ascent. Uh, there's the increased knee flexion, increased knee extension torque, um, basically moving toward a more normal gait pattern. But the compensations remained during descent. And so um, even though no, none of the biomechanical measures changed, patients uh, reported um, an increased perception of safety. And so from an overall functional standpoint, yes, there's a shift towards a, a more normal pattern. Um, and so what you see here are just uh, two manuscripts kind of suggesting that this device, through its adaptive motion, helps to shift the gait biomechanics to a more normal pattern, potentially uh, eliminating some of the uh, compensatory emotions. Uh, again, that same group, so what you'll see here in some of the literature is that groups will do a study and they'll test multiple different conditions. Um, you'll see that in our group where we did stairs and slopes and rocky terrain and agility activities. If you have an individual and you have the resources to do the study, you tend to uh, look at multiple different measures. In this particular study, they wanted to effect, uh, test the effect of the adaptive motion on the socket pressures. Um, and so, uh, again, in this case, they had data from 12 individuals. And um, kind of the, the big picture summary of this is that the adaptive motion resulted in pressures closer, closer to level walking. Uh, this particular device used the proprio, but that doesn't mean that this increased dorsiflexion and potentially toe clearance and spring during swing in any of the devices would uh, likely get you a, a similar benefit. Uh, this is a, a study um, through, from Bob Gailey's group down in Miami uh, looking at uh, application of self-report and performance-based outcome measures to determine function differences between four categories of prosthetic feet uh, in JRRD. And the purpose was to, and it, it's interesting the way the purpose is framed in terms of the ability of commonly used measurement instruments to detect functional differences between the feet. The, the way it is stated isn't that we're going to determine if the feet are different. We're going to see if our, our measurements can detect the differences between them. And so that's an important consideration. Um, in this, uh, they had 10 individuals with uh, transtibial amputation, um, ten, five with PVD, five without. Um, they used the, the four feet tested, and then they used a whole battery of uh, a different assessment measures to try to detect these differences between feet. Um, and the interesting finding um, in that in the trained individuals, after they've been trained, there was no significant difference between the groups. And so um, in this case, we had really a few different manuscripts suggesting that the, the adaptive or dorsiflex position during stairs and slopes um, may affect socket pressures and gait biomechanics, um, but there did not show up as any differences in this particular study. I put this in as a side note. We have a manuscript accepted to Prosthetics Orthotics International looking at the effect of um, this adaptive ankle motion on uh, slope ambulation, specifically looking at a metabolic cost. Um, and what we found is that 
and I, I didn't put the data up here because it's in press right now, um, but what we found is that with the proprio device, individuals were more efficient during downslope walking than with conventional devices. Um, a few important considerations here. Uh, the first one is it didn't matter whether or not the proprio was on or, or in a fixed position, they had in improved um, metabolic cost during downslopes, and so it may have to do with actually the characteristic differences of the, the proprio foot rather than the adaptive motion. Um, and Yep, I'll, I'll leave it there. We actually didn't see any differences in metabolic cost during level ground or upslope walking. As I mentioned before, suspension is an important consideration. And so what I have here is a picture of uh, a technique we developed to look at limb socket motion using digital video fluoroscopy. And so what you can see on the left there is this individual is wearing a proprio device um, and normal uh, limb socket displacement in our patient population with well-fitting sockets is about two centimeters. That's consistent with the published literature. Uh, you can see in the top picture, uh, let's see if I can get the laser pointer to work. Uh, you can see in the top picture that there's an air void at the bottom. And this is with a suction sleeve suspension. Uh, the person's expelled all the air. Um, but in that dependent position, you, you do get, still get an air pocket that forms. Um, this person had the proprio device. They had the added mass of, uh, of that. Um, and so in this particular patient, what we found is that adding a vacuum system significantly reduced that displacement. It cut it from uh, 18 millimeters of displacement down to just about 10 millimeters of displacement. So it's something that maybe if you're having issues with the socket fit, that added mass, there, there may be ways to work around that, uh, that consideration. I'm going to move on now. Um, in this presentation, I'm only talking about the, the, the proprio and the biome. The, the other manufacturers will talk about their uh, systems. But these are the devices that we've had experience with and tested. And I didn't want to speak outside the data uh, that we do have available to us. Um, so this is a, a publication we have in Archives of Physical Medicine and Rehab looking at the biome on level ground walking. Um, and the purpose was to determine whether or not the powered ankle foot prosthesis improves level ground gait mechanics, dynamic balance, agility, and user satisfaction. And in our study, we had individuals uh, with unilateral transtibial amputation. We had 11 of them, and we compared them to age-matched um, healthy control subjects. Um, and we, in this particular study design, because it was in parallel with clinical care, we did a pre-post assessment. So we compared their clinically prescribed kind of clinical optimum foot alignment, all that, with the biome um, as a fit uh, with the assistance of IWAC. And so I'll, I'll show this slide here. On the left, you can see uh, one individual. It's the same individual in both videos, and I'll see if I can toggle this. On the left-hand side, you see them in their energy storing and return foot, and on the right-hand side, you see the biome. And so I'll talk a bit about the biomechanical data, but I just want to let this run for a second and uh, just let you use your clinical perspective and eyes to, to judge what you see as, as potential differences or similarities between the two. What I do want to draw your attention to is on the, the right-hand video, you can see that that biome is pushing off. You see that ankle plantar flexion that it's, it's, as you'll see later, it's doing what it's supposed to. And so back to the, our initial set of questions, does it, do, does it operate as stated? Yes, the biome, it, it has the battery, it has the motor, it provides push-off power, it increases range of motion. Um, but when we go through to look at how the biome compares to conventional, their kind of that pre-post comparison, we see that the biome did provide that increased range of motion. Um, but we also found that um, the device was very early on. It was the first clinical fittings um, of the device. We saw, found that um, in that, that fitting process, our patients were very power hungry. And so they actually overshot. They, our patients with the biome had more ankle power than matched able body controls. And so that's something to keep in mind as you're looking at the data here. Um, but it, what we found is that in terms of the lower extremity uh, gait biomechanics, that the compensations remained, that um, at least in this cohort of highly trained active young individuals, uh, the, the compensations we saw associated with unilateral transtibial amputation were not corrected. Um, and we did see a, a trend towards maybe increased compensation proximally. Um, and it, it's an, I also want to point out that the PEQ scores, agility, and dynamic balance scores remained similar. Um, that can be looked at as both a positive or negative. You have something that's more complex, that has added mass. It didn't negatively affect their agility, but it also didn't provide a statistically significant improvement in it. And so uh, in terms of overall function, it improves self-selected walking velocity. Um, I've seen people who um, 
tend to be very serious, get big grins on their face, and they get the device, and they say, I felt something that I haven't felt in years, and it's a pretty powerful experience. Um, but what we find here is that in terms of the gate biomechanics, um, that doesn't carry through to some of the changes in reducing asymmetries uh, and, and deviations. Um, we saw a, a preference toward the biome, so on a scale where zero is, um, I my, I'm 100% committed to the ESR foot. Um, 100 is the biome is the, the best thing ever. I'd never go back. Uh, the mean score was 67. And so there was a, a trend towards preferring the biome. And what we saw is that it was somewhat bimodal. We had a few people who just didn't like the biome. One of them, here's my anecdote, he likes to go hiking. He doesn't like to charge his cell phone. He was done with it. And we had other people. We had uh, one individual who said it changed his, saved his marriage. He goes walking with his wife more. W in our results, we just saw no change in body weight. Um, but we did have some individuals. Uh, one came back and he had about a 30 pound weight loss um, because he was now going on these walks with his wife. And, and so we have the data here, and then we have all these anecdotal stories that, that go alongside it. And then on the metabolic cost reduction side, um, the, there's uh, the publication in the Proceedings of the Royal Society showing this reduction in metabolic cost, effects on transition work, um, and we have a manuscript that's in review now uh, supporting some of those improvements in metabolic cost. Um, but they weren't, very cons they weren't necessarily consistent. Um, and so that's where the tuning and other factors may come into play in terms of selecting the right foot for the right individual. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we assess the patients on stairs. Uh, the purpose was um, to determine if providing this power affects the stair biomechanics. Uh, we used the same cohort of individuals, the same comparisons. And again, I'll let you be the judge. And so this is the same individual going up the same flight of stairs with the two devices. I also want to emphasize that they had a minimum of a three-week acclimation period to the biome. And so it wasn't just that we, we put it on them and they, they did these activities. They had an opportunity to take it home and get, basically use it in their daily life. How am I on time? Okay. Yep. Um, so the bottom line is the biome, uh, again, operated as stated. You had increased power. It didn't actually get back to uh, fully, full restoration, but it, it provided increased range of motion, the plantar flexion power. Um, but the hip strategy that I mentioned when we were talking about the proprio device did not go away. We had very similar gait biomechanics. Um, one of the things we're working very hard at is figuring out where all this energy went and why the gait mechanics didn't change. Um, the, the assumption is you, you put it on, you restore that ankle function, and, and it fully restores. Um, some of it can potentially be tuning issues. Um, there's some training considerations. Uh, we really don't know how best to train our patients on these devices um, because we don't have the data to really make those those decisions. Um, and then there may be other design considerations in terms of the mechanics of the device function like the soleus muscle. It only crosses one joint. It doesn't cross the knee and, and have uh, the potential effects like the gastroc. And so we've kind of come back full circle. Um, we have some data to support different devices for different types of activities. Um, but what you see here is a lot of the considerations on this list have nothing to do with physical performance. Um, and that may explain some of the differences that we had in, in terms of um, our, our patient perception and the acceptance or, uh, in some cases, rejection of different devices, whether or not uh, they're willing to charge the batteries, whether or not um, if they want to essentially go from whatever their daily activities are to out hunting, um, which quite a few of our patients do, um, they may have to, to do a change. Um, do you want me to go through this quickly? Um, or call it good. Yeah, yep. we'll call it a day, and then if we have time at the end, maybe we'll bring it back. Sure. We're on a, we're on a tight schedule. If there, if there are any uh, burning questions, we can take one or two questions right now, but we have, a, we have quite a few speakers, and since we got a late start, uh, I didn't want to open it up too far. But if, sure. a, anybody have a quick question right now? No. I mean, I think it could be argued that the, uh, the folks that need this technology the most are not your study group, because mm -hmm. You, they have plenty of extra muscle and energy and power to do the work. Um, mm -hmm. Could you just briefly comment on that? I mean, the, the older folks, the... Um, sure, and so one of the things is we were going through the proprio study initially, we got a handful of subjects enrolled, and um, pa our patients uh, felt like it, it didn't meet the things that they needed to do in terms of the agility activities and that sort of thing, and so we actually didn't continue on with the study because we didn't have people enroll. Um, it, it's really a fine balance in terms of, again, I go back to the anecdotes where we have patients who are just extremely high functioning um, in, in many cases, and 
sometimes they want something that's more predictable, easier to use, and less hassle, uh, whereas others, um, like I gave the example of the patient with the biome, where it did have this positive impact on him, whether or not that was through the change in his biomechanics, change in his efficiency, just his change in the opportunity to use this technology kind of changed how he viewed the world and how he viewed his abilities. Um, that's the thing where the data is lacking and that's why, in, in my opinion, we have these types of uh, sessions where we're looking at selecting the most appropriate type device for an individual. Great, well that was a great talk, thank uh, you. May, may, I, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, Dr. Wolf, can you mention that uh, it, it, you have about three weeks that you allow training mm -hmm. and the compensatory mechanisms and the HIP strategies remain Mm -hmm. But yet, yet some of the O2 consumption measures decrease. Do you think that was an adequate amount of time for the motor learning process to, to get rid of those strategies? So it's a very commonly debated issue when you're looking at study design in terms of how long do you give an individual to acclimate. Um, some people will argue months. Um, from what we've seen, and this is again my own anecdote, is that even at just a few hours or a few minutes, our patients are able to readily adopt a pattern that we tend to see over time. And, and so, um, at least in my opinion, in terms of just the basic mindset of, yes, you put it on somebody and it does what it's supposed to, um, it, it could be as few as a couple of hours, maybe even minutes. Um, but it's really unknown, at least in our patient population, how long it takes for them to fully incorporate it and whether or not that change in weight for that particular patient was due to his just increased activity level due to perception or because he had better gait biomechanics and all those other factors. Uh, unfortunately, that's one of the big areas that's lacking. Are studies underway where they've been provided the device at inception uh, to compare so that they had not gotten the compensatory mechanisms from other devices? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have funding for any of that right now. Gotcha. I'd love to. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Thank you. That was a great talk. Okay, so next we're going to bring up uh, Michael Orndorff. And, uh, can you do your own introduction? Yeah, certainly. Thank you. I am a uh, senior scientist with OrthoCare Innovations and a director of the biomechanics laboratory there. I'm going to speak just briefly about our Magellan foot that we're uh, developing right now. So we started the development of this foot with a vision that said that the ankle was an incredibly important part of human gait. And, and there's a lot of prosthetic feet on the market and a lot of, or a few, microprocessor controlled feet. And the only reason we wanted to add to this area is because we felt that the potential benefit to the user had not yet been fully realized. So we came up with this sort of vision of what we wanted. We wanted something that was fast and fluid, silent, with precise but strong control. Um, we wanted it to be intuitive, that wouldn't take any conscious effort by the user to use it. We wanted to keep wireless connectivity between the patient and the prosthetist. We wanted the setup to be incredibly simple. Um, we used Europa biomechanical optimization, and we wanted the foot to be the go-to foot for a wide range of patients. So there are some of the uh, characteristics of the foot. You can go online and find those in the uh, data that sort of show how much uh, it weighs, it's battery life, range of motion, wireless, uh, patient weight, those kinds of issues. So we worked really hard to try and get the foot to meet these criteria. So we've spent more than 10 years looking at prosthetics biomechanics to help develop the foot. And we have truly adaptive control. It automatically and constantly adjusts ankle position for combinations of different activities and terrain. It uses recorded gait dynamics of the individual wear so the performance is optimized and accurate. And the range of motion is truly useful. Instead of having stops at particular regions, it have 4,000 potential neutral ankle positions that it can assume. So it has a very low demand on the prosthetist. Um, it's appropriate for a very broad range of patients, size, amputation level, activity. It's all self-contained. There's no special fabrication. The setup takes 30. Uh, 60 seconds and has just three steps. Um, you can do a typical bench alignment and then it can be directly swapped for other feet. It has minimal maintenance. And the most important, I think, is this self-documenting self evidence of benefit. So on your smartphone, you get a little output and it tells you what, you're, what you've been doing and how your steps have been adjusted. The data is also available to the prosthetist. You can share that information online with your prosthetist in real time. And I'll show you some of this at the end of the talk. 
So one of the things that we looked at, and I'm a researcher, I've been a researcher for 20 years, and w when I started to look at what people actually do out in the community, um, if you're a working adult in, in an urban environment having to do things, your most common walking bout is, is four plus or minus one steps in, in a row. So that means about 20% of the time or so, you stop within four steps. So it's a lot of shifting and adjusting and s short movements. So 40% of all your walking bouts last just 12 steps in a row, and 75% of them last just 40 steps in a row. So we do a lot of stop and go driving. If you do 60 steps in a row, that's much less than 1% of all the bouts that you do. So if you make a foot, that does really great job at doing 60 steps in a row. It's like building a car that only goes 40 miles an hour. It just doesn't really hit the categories that are necessary for mobility. So in human gait, when you're walking fast or when you walk slow, the shear forces on the ground reaction are exactly the same so that you are at constant speed whether you're walking fast or slow. In order to accelerate, you alter your ankle moment in order to reduce the braking impulse early in stance phase and you decelerate by lengthening that period of time. So the ankle moment's an incredibly important factor for being able to control your walking speed, for achieving faster or slower walking speeds, for avoiding people who are walking at you, for maneuvering around your kitchen and making dinner. So you change your walking speed often. Uh, something like 58% of your steps involve a uh, speed change for the gait of daily living, the kinds of things that you normally would do around whatever your activities are. So maneuvering and stability are the optimization goals. And about every fifth step is a turn. You get much less turns when you're walking outdoors or in a big institutional venue like this. But when you're in your house, you're constantly maneuvering around furniture's hallway, furniture hallways, those kinds of things. So gate initiation, accelerating, decelerating, turning corners, negotiating obstacles, that is the demand. And walking straight ahead at self-selected speed is a rare occurrence. If you build a laboratory where you can do 20 steps in a row, guess what kind of gate you study in your laboratory? You study walking 20 steps straight ahead. So, Competent ambulators walk without concentrating on these challenges. It's second nature to them. They just do it. So we wanted our foot to be able to be used in all those situations, whether it's hiking outdoors, exercising, or just trying on a great pair of shoes. So the range of motion is 19 degrees in dorsiflexion and 19 degrees in plantar flexion. And the ankle is passive. There's no added power from an uh, electrical system in there. So um, while there is a small battery that controls the artificial intelligence that decides what to do with the foot, there's no active power generation. The foot is effortless for the user. There's no work to be done. The automatic adaptations occur within the system and it's full-time and real-time connected to your mobile device, your phone, and if you care to share it with your prosthetist, that information as well. The one key is that the patient has to learn not to do anything with the foot, and that takes a little time to let Magellan work for them. So it has a smart power, a one-hour typical charge. The battery weighs an ounce, and it lasts up to four days on a single charge. So I'm going to share some of the preliminary biomechanical results that went in the development of the foot. We wanted to make sure that we could alter uh, the moment going upslope, that it would recognize the slope and alter the position of the foot. So the red is an up, unadjusted upslope, and the green is this adjusted upslope moment. And it, there's a 62% improvement, a decrease in the area under those curves. So loading on the socket is much lower in those circumstances. Uh, and this is the same thing for downslope. This is a transfemoral, unilateral transfemoral. And it's adjusted the uh, maximum heel moment and lengthened the amount of uh, time that the load is on the toe. Here is a transtibial, uh, looking at some upslope data. And it's shifted that curve toward the training data and reduced that early plantar flexor moment. And here's a downslope comparison where we want that early plantar flexor moment that keeps you from tumbling down the slope faster and faster and faster. So one of our key features here is this idea of connectivity. And you know, everything is connected. That's something that the CIA, Buddha, and OrthoCare Innovations all believe. How many people here have a smartphone? I think we're all pretty connected.
So the multiple ways that connectivity is really a key for us. You can connect their patient to the limb and you add real value and loyalty. They understand what their foot is doing and are provided information. Um, it makes the prosthetists have a really easy time of setup. It's a very simple iPad interface. Maintenance is simple. It's self-documenting, and so you can show, you know, that it was necessary for reimbursement purposes. And there's a real-time remote checkup and adjustment. So you can, on the phone, stream out their data, look at their stuff, and do some training steps online at a distance to get them adjusted. So to me, the most important factor is this idea of evidence-based practice, that you should be involved in learning and improvement in your practice as a prosthetist. And the better data is fed to you and the more you understand what your patient is doing, the better choice you can make. And so we're trying to keep up with that idea. So here's the look at the iPhone app that the device streams to your iPhone and tells you what it is that you've been doing. And you can share that information with your prosthetist and you can look at rehab outcomes or interventions to see how things have changed. So this is uh, G2. It's the tr streaming data that's available on the web online. And at the bottom, you have a complete time series of whatever event, ever event you're looking at. And it shows you the moments and the axial load and the displacement. It shows you the slope the individual is walking over and their speed. So we have all kinds of data looking at what the individual is doing out in the real world. So we are fed that information all the time. And we have used this to help develop the foot not in our laboratory, but out in the real world where people are actually doing things and get that information back so we can make adjustments to it. So I'd be happy to pull up the website and show it to anybody who'd like to see it. It's interactive. It's all vector graphics. You can zoom in or zoom out to any of those features and extract specific ankle moment data out at each point so if you'd like to look at it. Also, if you'd like to have some input in how that data is eventually uh, delivered to the prosthetist, now is the time to come speak to me and tell me what you want. <laughs> We're planning the output. So I appreciate your attention for today. And here are the references that I've, speak, I've spoken about today. And I'd be happy to share them with you. I have the PDFs on my laptop right here. Thanks very much. Any questions? That was great. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, it's interesting to get up here, and all of a sudden you can't see the uh, people in the crowd. Great to have you here. Uh, my name is Kurt Grubin. I am a uh, clinical specialist with OSER. Uh, hail from Wisconsin, so if you hear an out every once in a while, my apologies. Uh, just the accent thing from up north. But happy to share a little bit about the proprio foot with you. Uh, this will be fairly brief. Well, I'd like to give you a, a few key things about what the proprio entails. Just a technical overview of the device essentially is it has a motor on board that uh, controls the position of the angle uh, and it does this during swing phase. So primarily what we see happening with the proprio is that it gives a prepositioning of that foot for the next stance phase. It also provides some dorsiflexion during swing. So this motor is a, a threaded screw uh, that uh, operates by spinning motor, uh, drives the heel up or down, and prepositions that foot. The foot is an LP Veriflex foot module uh, with carbon fiber that is underneath, and the battery is uh, attached to the socket up above that. So uh, the, the Proprio does, uh, Jason did mention about the adaptivity to, uh, to slopes, and uh, the, what the Proprio does is it recognizes what the, sl the slope of the person is according to its accelerometry. Uh, what the person is on and adapts over a period of several steps. So it does make sense that over uh, in his study that over uh, several steps, uh, if it was a relatively short uh, period, you wouldn't get full accommodation until about three or four steps. But you do get gradual accommodation on a ramp beginning with that second step. After it's seen one step on a, on a ramp, it's going to start the accommodation but does not do it all at once. So just a clarification there. Uh, so we have an idea of what, uh, what really it, it is intending to do there. Uh, with that, I'd uh, like to focus in on a few functional outcomes of what we've seen uh, with the proprio. Uh, there are, uh, when we look at uh, stance phase, the ankle uh, that is unique to, I think, the proprio, the ankle remains in a, a fixed position when going over in, in the normal gait pattern. So prepositioning is the idea here. The motor is going to preposition the foot for whatever terrain is underneath. 
and hold that position during stance phase as someone rolls across it. We'll see a video of this, uh, but uh, that's the primary thing that we see in the beginning here. Stable, when someone uh, puts their weight on it, they can trust where that position is and understand that uh, uh, the proprioception of that foot and where it is in space is there for them. Uh, also, uh, powered swing phase. So swing phase dorsiflexion of five degrees during each and every step. This is a consistent amount of dorsiflexion uh, every, every step. So uh, regardless of how uh, roll over the toe of the previous step happens, regardless of the step length, regardless of whether the patient uh, lifts the, the foot early, prematurely off of the ground, we still have the accelerometry noticing that it's in swing phase and going to five degrees of dorsiflexion during swing. This also happens uh, to adjust according to the speed at which the patient walks. Uh, also, flexion range of the proprio is a full 28 degrees uh, with heel height accommodation, which is that last point uh, that we still have 10 degrees of dorsi and 10 degrees of plantar flexion available for adjustment. So even with a heel height adjustable foot, uh, we have the opportunity still to accommodate with extra plantar flexion or dorsal flexion to accommodate to slopes. Anecdotally, we see and hear results from, from users out in the field, and they, they use some words to describe that. These are some of those, those general words. Uh, natural uh, is something that people will mention as they're walking with, with the proprio. Uh, there are some, uh, in, in fact, some of the studies that Jason referenced. Uh, we have references to that. Some of our, uh, our statements here are based upon those studies. Some are also based upon some case studies as well as some abstracts that uh, we do have reference to. So if you're interested in that, I do have a flyer that's available I can share with you after, uh, after the talk this morning. So natural, uh, being able to uh, reduce some of those compensatory movement uh, motions. Uh, there is, there's reported from users that uh, that's what they feel. Uh, the adaptation to the terrain is one of the big elements that Propria provides. It can see what type of terrain it's on and, and know that the, the correct position to pre-position pre that foot towards. Security, being able to have that foot in a solid position upon stance and then also having the foot in the adapted position when going up a slope or down a slope as well. There's some adaptation that we'll see in a few slides forward here about stair ascent and stair descent as well. So as we go forward, I'll show you a video here and we should have this uh, prompted. If you roll over the, the picture, you will see the plate. There we go. Awesome, thank you. So uh, what we'll see here is dorsiflexion during swing, five degrees of dorsiflexion uh, according to the speed at which the patient's walking. Uh, what we see from this is a level of confidence that users find if they're on uneven terrain. They don't necessarily know when they're gonna step down into that low spot. And they don't necessarily know how they're going to roll over their toe from the previous step. So the proprio in every single step, accommodating that five degrees of dorsiflexion during swing, gives that confidence. About 15 to 20 millimeters of extra range of motion or extra clearance that the proprio provides, as shown in the graph that you see up on the screen right now. Uh, so we see uh, uh, some, li some less compensatory movements, uh, and then also uh, just has the users move around a little bit more natural way. A bilateral user pointed something out to me in the early days of Proprio, and this should be fairly obvious to, it, to us all, but as he came back after several days of wearing the Proprio, he mentioned, and this is, again is an anecdote, but he mentioned, Kurt, I felt much more confident on uneven ground. I did not go on uneven ground with my previous feet, which were uh, mechanical-based feet. He says, one thing you need to remember, Kurt, bilaterals can't vault. So his ability to use other strategies was diminished. He didn't have the plantar flexion strategy to compensate for if he happens to step in a, a low spot. So the confidence that someone gains from uh, this product is, is one of the things we're seeing in the field. Stair ascent. What the proprio does is provides a prepositioned uh, five degrees, either, excuse me, four or six degrees of dorsiflexion when uh, it recognizes that the person is on stairs. So it puts that foot into a dorsiflex position, which centers the socket up over that foot. What we're seeing is the ground reaction forces are being aimed more directly towards the knee center as opposed to in front of the knee center. This translates into, anecdotally, patients commenting that I feel more comfortable in my socket. Anecdotally also, that uh, I've noticed I didn't have to do as many adjustments to my socket during, after the fitting. And we assume, we're pretty sure that has to do with the change in the ground reaction forces there. 
We also have the ability of that knee center to be a little bit further forward, and that allows a little easier reach to that next step. So a little more confidence in where that, uh, where that person is placing their foot. On stair descent, there also is a five degrees, or excuse me, four or six degrees of uh, dorsiflexion. This is prepositioned, and it allows the person to put more of their foot on the step. So if we're thinking about safety and how much foot is actually in contact with the step, we certainly have the ability to move that foot further back, allow the dorsiflexion uh, to be able to roll over that toe more easily, get past the prosthesis keeps the foot on the step instead of rolling over the edge of that step and potentially slipping off of it in case of maybe a, a wet environment. I'm going to back up, if you will. One thing I should also mention during stair ascent is during swing phase dorsiflexion, active dorsiflexion of five degrees, five degrees additional dorsiflexion to what the stance position is, is still uh, being done. So if, if you have a four degrees of uh, dorsiflexion during stance, on stair ascent, the swing phase position is going to go up to nine degrees. It's going to give extra clearance of that toe uh, to help clear that step. Ramp ascent. What the proprio does, it recognizes that terrain that's underneath and uh, will accommodate uh, that position of the, of the foot. So if you could hit the video here, if you don't mind. Uh, we have uh, a couple things going on. I'll, I'll lay out a few key words that I try and think of when I'm looking at someone walking up ramps uh, on the proprio. I think of balance, first of all. I think of efficiency of gait, and then also of ground reaction force and the ground contact that foot makes with the, the underlying slope. Some of these are very, very obvious uh, and, and come to, into play in a number of feet that are available. A couple things to think about here. One of them is that with the proprio fixing itself into that dorsiflex position before landing on it, it allows that foot to hit the ground at the heel and allows the person to be more efficient in moving their center mass over that prosthesis because they don't have to advance their weight as far forward to be able to balance over the prosthesis. They're making heel contact. Can you play that video again if you don't mind? They're also getting more of their foot in contact with the ground. This gives us two benefits. Ground contact would just gives a, a, a friction. More foot in contact with the ground, less chance of slipping. But the other element here is there's a lot more of that foot in contact with the ground during mid stance so that balance can be maintained. If someone were to need to stop halfway through the step, we've got that foot in place and it's actually held stably in that place while they're, while they're walking up that ramp. You take advantage of the full dynamics of the foot so you get the heel compression, which has a dynamic effect on what happens with the roll over the toe as well. So that position of dorsiflexion holding allows the person to take advantage of the dynamics of that foot and rolling over the toe. Easier to get over the toe because the dorsiflexion happens as well. In decline, still ad adjusting towards the angle of decline, but a percentage of the actual full decline level here. Uh, reports are that uh, patients feel less of the pressure up through the socket again. They don't feel as much of their heel compression. They also feel that they have more support at the end of stance. If you think about balance and you think about ground contact, you still have more of that in each of these scenarios. So you certainly have the benefit of, of better traction and then also uh, of just easier rollover. Heel height adjustability. Along with the other dynamics of the proprio foot, uh, the proprio through a series of pressing a couple of buttons on the front of the foot is going to be able to recognize what heel height the person is using and it will readjust to that. And this is something the user does at their home when they put on a different pair of shoes. If you can, play that video again, please. Uh, so what, what we see certainly is the ability for someone to go from a barefoot scenario to a low shoe, to a, uh, a heel height up to about an inch and a half in order to allow the same gait dynamics that we align for in the office is still present when that person changes to the other shoe. They still have range of motion of dorsiflexion 10 degrees and plantar flexion at least 10 degrees when they're using each of these heel height scenarios. So you've got opportunities for a variety of shoes, but yet the same dynamics that you create in your original alignment are still available for you in, in the rest of the adjustment and the rest of the use of that prosthesis. One other element, a couple other features of the, uh, the appropriate foot are the uh, relaxed function when someone is sitting down. Uh, there's a function in which the, the foot 
goes into a plantar flex position and allows them to get more of the foot in contact with the ground and it allows them to stabilize that foot. So while sitting, it's in plantar flexion. With a, a pretty simple cue, the foot then can be triggered into going into a dorsiflex position of five degrees and allows the person to use that five degrees dorsiflex position in order to help them up out of the chair. Now they're still doing the work, but the positioning of the foot and where that foot contacts the ground it can be of an advantage to them. By having a dorsiflex foot getting up out of a chair, you get pressure at the heel and require less of that person to bring their, less energy to put, put their weight forward onto the prosthesis. They can balance over that foot sooner in their exit from the chair. And with a simple swing of the leg after they're out of the chair, that foot will return back to a neutral position. So with that, You've got a few elements here. Uh, the stance phase stability, of maintaining that position, the motor holding that position during stance phase. This is good for stance stability in static situations, but also in, in uh, walking situations as well. You have the clearance varying swing, so extra clearance, extra confidence, and then certainly uh, the full flexion range in addition to whatever heel height is available or is desired for that user. So hopefully get, this gives you a, a fairly clear picture of what uh, Propria has to offer. There's certainly more details and more to it than that, but uh, those are the primary things that you can take and understand about the functionality of what this device brings to the table. So thank you. Any questions? Great. Thank you very much. Okay, Alan, now you're up. Good morning, everybody. Yeah. All right. Well, the first uh, comment I wanted to uh, talk to you about was what is biomimetic. Um, it's been bandied around for several years now, way back to 2008 when we first came out with it with the Echelon. And really, we look at it as a design philosophy based on the scientific understanding of nature and how that nature has been engineered and how it works. And it's an amalgam of two words, biology and mimic. So what we try to do is mimic um, our, our biology through some technologies that we, uh, we've studied. Um, if you look at some of the issues that amputees have when they're in uh, more rigid ankle feet, um, I know he doesn't have to stand on this slope, but he is. Um, he has to use a lot of compensation on other parts of his body just to stand upright or try and stand upright. So it's a lot of wear and tear on other joints uh, and the muscular system on, for this amputee. So what we've tried to look at is to say, well, what can we do to ease this particular uh, situation for these individuals, whether they be you know, transfemoral or transtibial. Uh, so if we look at some of the rigid ankle feet systems, um, there's an equilibrium of the springs which push against the body from either the toe or the heel. And what they don't do, um, could you click the little animation slide on the right there for me? There you go. What they don't do is they, they don't help counter some of the pressures um, that the individuals would feel within the socket, uh, particularly in this transfemoral, uh, transtibial, um, that can oppose some of the natural forces of them just wanting to stand in a relaxed position. So there's um, some technologies that we look at and say, well, how can we help individuals like this, um, with limiting, you know, technologies that that they wear, that make their life easier, encountering everyday normal walking, and for this particular guy who struggles to walk down a, a fairly steep ramp as an above knee amputee, but on level ground in an optimal uh, aligned level surface, he, he walks relatively very well in the prosthesis that he's got. So we developed a, a viscoelastic system, which, which is hydraulic chamber that works with the heel and toe springs. And if you look at these two individuals that are standing on a particular slope, the one on the left that's wearing this viscoelastic system uh, compared to the one on my right, which is the uh, transtibial. If you look at the rigid ankle foot that's lifting off the ground and the movement and the motion that he has to have at the hip joint, to be able to stand more comfortably with the foot flat. Compared with the, the transfemoral, it actually is just minimal movement at the hip, but standing a lot more stable, a lot more comfortable. So these are the types of things that, that we've come to, 
to work with and come up with. So biomimetic muscle and gait control. We looked at some static situations previously, but how do our human feet behave in gait and what makes them so efficient or adaptable? So we need to look at some of these things. The shape's critical, the rollover shape's critical. There's been evidences of studies many, many years ago that give the functional rolling edge of the shape. And if you see the bottom three lines between these two arrows, when am amputees are asked to walk at what speed they're most comfortable at, they'll pick the one that's the most efficient for them. And if they go up above it or below it, they have to compensate because the foot function is not there helping them uh, ambulate. So let's look at passive dynamic locomotion. Um, if you look at the robot, it's not powered. Um, it's, it's not got anything other than the rollover shape of the foot walking down a ramp. And if the ramp was long enough, the shape of the foot is correct enough for it to continue for a long period of time. If the shape isn't correct or something interrupts that ramp as he's walking down it, then obviously there's a, a trip or a fall and it's not going to keep progressing as you see in the video. So the shape is is important. If we look at um, some work done from uh, the rollover shape analysis from Hansen and Childress at Northwestern, um, take the data of the center of pressure under the foot, combine it with the shank motion, and then look at the shank and plot, then you get this rollover shape with, is there a uh, laser pointer, there you go. The rollover shape, which is this curve, which is the most efficient um, in, in the human ankle. That shape is there whether we use a lower heel height barefoot or a, or a taller heel height. The ankle adapts to give that same rollover shape dependent on which heel, whether you use medium, high or low. The same shape occurs at each of these particular um, um, parts of the gait cycle. So our body naturally uses its muscular uh, system to maneuver the foot to accommodate and adapt to the specific ground over locomotion. So let's look at it to make this simple, or try and make it simple. We we'll look at, if we look at the, the, a wheel or a ball and make it round, that we want the body to progress forward and walk over. How can we control or mimic some of the things that go on in the natural uh, muscular system? To, to transfer that into a prosthetic device which helps an amputee walk with greater ease and have specifically less issues with maybe socket pressures and, and comfort and less compensation on other parts of the body. We can create this rolling edge um, as follows using this technology with the Elan with the hydraulic body that we've got in there controlling the viscosity and say the, the thickness of the oil to let it flow or reduce. Um, combine that with the springs that hit the contact of the ground to give either some type of assistance in propulsion and braking effect as you roll over the foot. So we want to create this, this rollover uh, pattern you know, with the, with the um, mimicking of a, of a prosthetic product to help amputees. So we control it in, in several different ways. There's, there's one particular setting that would be for the level ground, which you'd get resistance from the heel and the toe in, uh, in a satisfactory plantar flex and dorsal flex moment of the hydraulic for level ground. We can increase the resistance of the hydraulics or reduce the resistance of the hydraulics to give a simulation of less or more pushback from the springs that they work together with. So what we're doing is we're simulating the muscle contractions with the hydraulic and the springs that help that rolling edge be maintained, whether amputees are walking on level ground or whether they walk up or down those inclines. Um, go back to the ball analogy in this wheel, that if something interrupts this wheel, the body has to compensate for it and it doesn't flow in a momentum. So what we've got is, is we've got an option to control some of the resistances at heel strike um, to enable maybe to stiffen the plantar flexion moment, which gives more dynamics to the heel spring 
to push the body forward. So there's a, a look of top spin on the ball. If you want the ball to continue further and you put top spin on it, the ball hits the ground and motions forward. If we change the resistance of the hydraulic chamber, that will allow us to, to use more of the carbon energy's storage from the heel to push the amputee forward. And then progress and roll over the toe, of which we can reduce the hydraulic resistance in dorsiflexion, so there's not an issue to slow down the tibial progression if an amputee is wanting to walk a little bit faster. The same effect is when we want to walk up to up a slope. You know, we've, we've got to mimic this natural ankle or natural muscle um, usage that we use in a, in a normal ankle to try and mimic that by changing the hydraulic or the um, spring uh, I say dynamics, um, to, to make them blend together. We actually want the amputees to walk up a slope as easy as possible. The goal is to get them to walk with as less compensation as possible. So again, if we change the hydraulic stiffness and that increases the resistance from the heel, it feels like they get a bit of a push. And when the foot is pointing up the slope, although it may be dorsiflexed up to three or four degrees, as you roll over it, we still want to reduce the hydraulic resistance to get over so it aids the tibial progression when we're walking up a slope. Next slide. So you see we changed that shape in, uh, in order to, to make it easier to walk up. So really it's got assist, or an assist we, we call it, for faster walking on level ground, which will automatically change the resistance in the spring combination and then also up the slope. So the momentum of the body doesn't have to work so hard to get up it. Likewise, obviously that rollover shape is going to change when you come down. So some of the dynamics in the foot have to change. So again, if you think about the ball, the body wants to walk down the slope. If you put backspin on the ball, you can hold the ball from the momentum of going forward and just hold it back a little bit. A little bit of backspin, the ball hits the ground. And in that collision of the heel, it revolves backward to stop the momentum of the body just going down a slope. So what we do is reduce the, the plantar flexion to a minimal amount that allows the heel to be softer and then increase the dorsiflexion resistance of the hydraulic to, to help the amputee from stop slowing down. Okay, so now we've got a braking effect of we've changed from going up on level ground and down, a braking effect to hold the amputee further back so it just aids that tibial progression. And again, you can see from the, the rollover shape, from the ground collision of the heel and rollover, if we change the hydraulics and spring combination, we can put what would effectively be a backspin on the, on the ball, which holds the amputee up from rushing down the ramp. So the braking effect is obviously the backspin of the ball. When it hits the ground, we want to slow them down, softer plantar flexion, stiffer dorsiflexion of the hydraulics, and the springs do their work by changing the combinations of the, of the durometers of the dynamics of the spring. So again, um, we've tried to mimic exactly what's going on with the natural ankle by controlling this rollover shape, which is the, the one that's most efficient for the amputee to walk in. I wanted to show you in a sort of a, in a real time, um, I'd ask a couple of questions to see if anyone's going to pick it up, but I'll tell you the answer up front. Um, the neutral mode, which is really an, a non-programmed, is functioning basically like an echelon, okay, which is still great foot, right? There's, there's plenty of them out there. The assist mode is slightly different. Um, if we look at the next slide, we slowed it right down. You see the difference between the neutral mode is that the plantar flexion has reached its maximum and the heel is compressed. What happens with the hydraulics when it's stiffened in there, it doesn't plantar flex as much when the body loads it, so therefore the heel is utilised more and it's flatter. So that's more dynamics to push the empty forward. So that's the, that's the concept of, of getting up or walking faster on level ground or up the slope. So this is the assist mode that we're talking about, to try and maintain this this curve. And likewise, coming down, you can see from the steels on the right-hand side that the plantar flexion is softer 
and then the dorsal flexion is increased, you can see that on heel strike, the spring is not as dynamic, so it's not pushing them. It doesn't need to push them. What we want is we want control from the front end. So what we're trying to do is mimic the contractions of the muscles within the shin that are missing for these individuals to control some type of walking environment outside of, of the level ground to make it easier. If you look at um, normal ankle motion, somewhere between about 25 and 28 degrees is, is what you'd get um, for a normal ankle. And simulating that, overlaying, this is the part of the hydraulic function of the foot. So it's, it's got this three degrees of motion within the dorsiflexion beyond neutral, which would hold it there to clear the ground. And then the six would be the plantar flexion motion, which you can see from the, the videos is enough. And then couple that with the spring motion as well. Um, there's nine also at the heel and 15 at the toe. So you're covering the, the 25, 28 degrees with 33 degrees of an option, if, if need be, dependent on, on alignment. So we're well within the spectrum of trying to mimic what goes on with a natural ankle. So with that, what we can say is when you do put these types of devices onto these individuals, there is absolutely no doubt that it's given them the confidence to walk down much easier than the very first slide that you saw when he had a little bit more difficulty with, um, with a more rigid ankle foot. Okay? That's much easier for him. Much less compensation on his body and much easier for him to walk down the slope. And I think that's the goal of, of what we should be looking for. Uh, just quickly, some contraindications on, on the foot. Um, lower level walkers that are in canes and walkers really, you know, probably don't benefit from this type of foot. So it's definitely your K3. Um, sport activities, dependent on what your sport is. You know, there's no problem doing sort of racquetball games. I think golfing's not really a, a high active sport, and sorry about that offending anyone playing golf, but I don't do I'm not a retired sportsman yet, so. Um, so if you were talking about running, um, you need specialist foot. Yeah, probably you would have to not choose this particular system. But if you're walking uh, treadmills and doing fitness in gyms and whether you're using the inclined treadmills or not, um, it, it's fine. It's fine for those types of activities. Um, cognitive skills need to be into consideration as well because you've, you've got to charge it. It should be charged every day. It lasts about 27 hours, but it should be charged every night. Just like you charge your cell phones. Um, and obviously, if there's some hand disability, the seven pin plug that goes together that twists and locks, it could be difficult for some individuals to do it. Um, presently, um, that's the, the system that we use. Um, it's difficult to find seven pin plugs that are actually durable enough to put into a system and easy enough for people to use. Um, so that's the only option at this moment in time. Uh, with that, I will say thank you very much for your time and listening, and I hope you've learned in a short period of time a little bit about uh, the Alain Foot. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Jack Richmond uh, with the uh, Phil Hour Company is going to be talking to you today about the, uh, the Hosmer Raise device. Um, yeah, my presentation contains a lot of anecdotal things because it uh, happens to be that I wear the foot uh, myself, helped in the development of the device as well. Um, and uh, so that's, that's helped me a lot to understand um, the patient aspect of it as well as the technical aspects of it. You've had some other presenters that have, that have been up that have talked about a lot of the, the technical aspects, why, you know, this ankle or a, a, a microprocessor controlled ankle uh, has advantages over a standard uh, carbon type ankle. Um, and those are certainly very evident watching the videos, seeing people walk um, with those different different feet. I'm going to go through a few features of the raise, some things that makes it maybe a little bit different than the other feet that are, that are out there um, and are available. Um, so let's get started with that. Okay. First of all, what, 
what can the rays do or what does the rays do. The rays is a microprocessor controlled uh, hydraulic ankle. It's built on top of a really good uh, base of carbon blades. That was the first thing that we did. We went out and found some, uh, actually our company Emotus uh, out in Salt Lake City that makes all of our uh, composite feet. One of our fellow our companies uh, developed the composite blades for us. The first thing we started off with was a very good composite platform. Um, we added on top of that an ankle that has 28 degrees uh, range of motion using a hydraulic valve that opens and closes during the gait cycle to allow things like normal level uh, walking and also walking up and down stairs as you can see um, in this video. Um, what's actually going on, I was asked to talk about what's actually going on uh, during the, the gait cycle. So during the gait cycle, while I'm walking, we're cycling the, the valve open and closed basically to a couple of uh, different positions. At the initial heel strike, what's happening is the valve is almost completely open to allow a lot of shock absorption, that nice uh, heel cushion as I land on, on the heel. Um, as I move then, uh, the foot starts to come down to foot flat. Uh, to keep from the foot slapping, the valve is closing to about 50% uh, in my particular case of its actual setting. Um, then as I start to progress across that midline, I need that dorsiflexion resistance, a little greater resistance. It ramps up to about 68% of the valve being closed. And then when I get just past neutral where I have mine set for the heel height or the dorsi stop, which are really the same, um, the valve actually closes 100% at that point, and that creates that Dorsey stop gives me the push off um, that I need, takes advantage of those carbon blades that we put underneath of the device. Um, so, what are some of the advantages, um, anecdotally, from an amputee's uh, standpoint of um, uh, walking on an ankle that has a full range of motion? This is actually a picture of me um, walking uh, early in the morning uh, in, on a bridge uh, that goes from the Hunter Museum over the Walnut Street uh, Bridge uh, in downtown Chattanooga. It was early in the morning. This is a glass bridge, and uh, the glass bridge, that's not dust on the bridge, that's actually condensation that had settled, that's dew on top of that bridge. So I'm actually walking on uh, a glass bridge there, actually walking on wet glass. That's something with a regular, I would never attempt that with a regular prosthetic foot and if I wasn't covered by workman's comp. Uh, but uh, of course I was and uh, I was walking on a microprocessor controlled ankle. So it's really a huge advantage to have the foot actually rotate, back, actually come down to the ground instead of landing on just the heel and having the heel that maybe would slide out from underneath me. As that foot comes down and meets the ground, now I've got the entire surface of the shoe that's gripping the ground that's actually creating um, that um, uh, stable platform for me to be able to roll over. That does make a huge difference. Um, a video here that was shot a, a couple of weeks ago uh, in, in Tennessee. Yes, it, it does snow in, in Tennessee, and I was on some snow and ice. It froze pretty hard the night before. Uh, it was pretty slippery out there, and my dog was doing, uh, the, Lily was doing the best that she could to, to try to drag me down. She had just seen a squirrel, and she was pretty sure that she needed to go and, and chase that squirrel. So I'm trying to hold her back and, and yet do a, a nice demo uh, walking on uh, snow and ice here. But you can see as the, as the heel comes down, the foot comes down and meets the ground, it's just very smooth rolling over top of that foot versus trying to dig in the heel, now progress the tibia forward, go to mid stance, and then going up to the toe and just being on the toe. The foot is staying flat on the ground, creates a, a tremendous amount of uh, stability uh, for me during the, during the gait cycle. As you can see, we'll slow it down a little bit here so you can see the range of motion. The raised foot does have have uh, 28 degrees mechanical range of motion. So it has 18, from the factor, 18 degrees of plantar flexion and 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. In addition to that, we do get about 12 degrees of deflection out of the carbon blades. The uh, thing that's kind of important to understand, there are a lot of the feet that are out there, that's one of the important differences between them is the range of motion that you actually have in the foot hydraulic. Some of the feet um, choose to, or some of the systems choose to use 
more carbon, less hydraulic. Others use more hydraulic range of motion, less carbon fiber range of motion. So that's an important difference as you're looking at the, the feet that are out there and choosing the foot that is uh, going to be best uh, uh, for your patient is that overall range of motion mechanically. Okay. So the components of the uh, raised micro microprocessor foot system are the, uh, the foot, uh, the controller, we have a battery pack, and then we also have a key fob uh, remote here. Um, using that key fob remote, um, I can go through several different settings. I'll go through those in, in just a minute and show you all the things that I can do uh, with that key fob remote. It is a microprocessor controlled uh, hydraulic, um, a little peek under the hood there. It is a hydraulic cylinder, a, a, a traditional, typical type of hydraulic cylinder. When you look at it from the outside, that's controlled by a uh, motor, uh, that's, uh, that's actually actuated by the microprocessor control. Um, some of the controls that are, that are inside there, the foot has an accelerometer. Um, it has a Hall's effect sensor. It also has a gyro. The uh, functions of each are, of course, the accelerometer is going to detect when motion has actually occurred uh, in the foot. Then the um, accelerometer, or the, rather the gyro, is going to detect that the foot is in the proper position to the earth. It's looking at the bottom of the foot and where that is in position to the earth, okay, are we ready for heel strike at that point? Those two things being okay, then it's ready to open that valve and prepare for heel strike. The Hall's effect sensor is really just a fancy, you know, uh, potentiometer. It's telling the position, or a goniometer, it's actually telling the position of the foot to the pylon. It's detecting that and sending that information uh, back to the microprocessor. Um, we do use a micro uh, precision control valves, um, a lot of very precise machining um, that goes on in order to get that hydraulic uh, right, obviously. Um, so the adjustments that I can actually make um, with the key fob, let me step over here, maybe on this side, um, if we can, yeah, we still have uh, uh, an angle where you can see me there. So um, using the remote, or using the controls that are actually on the, the leg itself, I can make um, adjustments um, to the raise. So if I want to change my heel height, which is a very important thing. We talked a little bit about heel height adjustment. Heel height adjustment, you know, really is huge. You think about it, if you send the patient home, you've got their foot perfectly aligned in the shoe that they're wearing. They go home, they take their shoes off. They're now a half to three quarters of an inch out of alignment. That's at the ankle. Imagine, or at the heel, imagine what that is now as far as socket forces that it's creating um, up around the brim of the socket. So very important for uh, your patients that are diabetic, especially brittle diabetic, having a properly aligned prosthesis. Now I go home, I can take my shoes off, I press two buttons, press the center button, and I can put it into that heel height adjustment mode. And it's telling me right now that when this, all three lights are on, the light in the center, that I'm actually in the center there. I can actually now change it, create a little bit more dorsiflexion, create a little bit more plantar flexion. I can put that pylon back into the neutral position and be able to walk. So it's just that simple to be able to set the heel height. The other things that I can do with with the key fob is I can increase the resistance. I can also decrease the resistance. Sometimes when I'm carrying a heavier load um, or walking on a harder surface or harder shoes, I actually find it necessary to increase the resistance to match the resistance that the hydraulics are, are sensing. Um, as I'm walking on soft ground, I might actually want to reduce the amount of resistance that's in the foot to kind of match that uh, is there. So this gives the user that adjustability to increase or decrease the settings uh, from what you've set it up for them initially. The, uh, in addition, the other things that I can do using the, the key fob is that I can completely unlock the foot so I can put it into a free motion mode. Um, and uh, now I just press one button, return it back to the regular functioning mode. I can also completely lock it in one position as well. Locking it is especially important for driving. That's a, that's a time that I definitely need to, to lock it out uh, so that, um, because I use my right foot for the accelerator, so it's an important thing to uh, have that foot locked in, in that position uh, for driving. Um, it, it will accommodate for 
ramps uh, initially up to about 12 degrees in uh, incline or decline uh, with the foot automatically using the hydraulics, using the microprocessor and using the carbon fiber blades that are there, all three of those working together. It, it's a huge difference. This is about the, the slope that I'd be going down uh, in when I'm uh, getting on an airplane at the, at the airport. And it's really a blast, you know, and I've got that backpack on and I actually, you know, just walking down and utilizing that hydraulic function or hiking, you know, a lot of times long downhill for hiking or long uphill, having the hydraulic really makes a huge difference uh, in that. So the battery life um, is 18 to 20 hours, does need to be charged up every night. It does have a safe mode that it goes into, uh, which creates a static hydraulic. If the battery happens to go down to 10%, it'll, it'll create a static hydraulic. Um, the specification of the foot requires three and a half inches of clearance uh, in order to be able to fit it in. Currently available in sizes 24 uh, to 30. Um, Range of motion, as I stated before, it is a, a total of 28 degrees. We have 18 degrees plantar flexion, 10 degrees of dorsiflexion, 12 degrees in the blades gives us a total of uh, 40. But mechanical range of motion, I think, is what's really important here, 28 degrees. Uh, we do have a graphical user interface for setting the foot up. I won't go into a lot of details with that. Come by the booth, we'll be happy to show you uh, that the system is available uh, currently. And uh, we will be uh, introducing the uh, blue Bluetooth connection uh, within the next month or so. So um, in conclusion, I'll say, uh, raise your expectations of what a um, microprocessor foot can do. Now, I'm going to take off my I'm going to take off my marketing hat for a se second, and I'm going to say, um, practitioners that are, that are here, for your patients, this could make a huge difference in their life. Your, their brains really want a microprocessor. They want an ankle. They want to have an ankle back. Just like a microprocessor-controlled knee is important, ankles are the same way. I wore this foot when I first got it for 30 days straight without taking it off. I wanted to put it through all its paces. One day took it off, put my other regular uh, carbon prosthesis back on. I took a step and I stumbled. I caught my foot. It felt weird. What's, you know, what the heck is going on? Am I not fitting in my socket right? I didn't feel like I was going down inside my socket all the way. I pulled it off, checked the number of socks I had, checked the alignment. Everything was good. Put it back on, stumbled a few more times. I started to freak out a little bit. I thought, you know, what, you know, if I had a stroke or something, I can't walk. And, and what uh, it actually, had, you know, suddenly dawned on me was my brain, after 25 years, had gone back to thinking, oh, I've got an ankle on both sides. And it had adapted to that. And it took me about 20 or 30 minutes um, to get used to wearing my regular carbon fiber uh, prosthetic foot again. So. Tremendous technology. Um, pick the one that's appropriate, but try some on your patients. I think you'll make them very happy. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here with you today. And um, uh, again, Brian Frazier, I know many of you. I'm the Director of Clinical Services with IWALK. And so what I want to do today is just give you a quick overview of the biome system. So just so I know again, how many of you have fit, actually fit one of our devices? Okay, so that's actually a, a fair number of you. So, okay, slide. Oh, I've got the controls. All right. I, I saw them kept talking to them today. I was like, oh, we're going to do it remotely. So just a quick overview. So we're, first we're going to discuss why do we have the need for this type of technology? Uh, that's going to be really important to establish. I think you're going to see uh, a, a very clear differential between what we're trying to achieve with, it, with this device that's never been done before. Discuss a little bit about the technology itself, some of the clinical evidence that's out there, our patient criteria. So talk to you a little bit about who we're fitting, uh, why we've gravitated toward the demographic that we have, and a little bit about the case studies and research that's out there, and if we've got a minute or two at the end to field some questions. So the first thing I think that's important to point out is that why is there a need for a system that not only replicates the skeletal system, which a lot of the, the blades and passive, quasi-passive systems out there do, but why is there also a need to emulate muscle and tendon? I think if we look at the two primary challenges in, in foot technology today, if we could remedy those two things, range of motion, which we've already started to see a lot of that with some of the other technology, but then the other part of that equation, which is just as important, is emulating muscle function and tendon. So we need to be able to solve both of those 
problems in order to restore normal biomechanics uh, for amputees. But if you look at what we've basically dealt with for the last 20 years, and for those of you that don't know, I'm an, I'm an amputee as well for about 20 years. And so I've used this technology for a long time, and it's interesting to me that though it served relatively well for a lot of our patients, uh, we've still been stuck with that exact, exact same technology since the mid-80s. Uh, it's almost like we take patients today, uh, let's say you, were, you went into your eye doctor and you have extremely poor vision to where you almost can't see uh, when, in, when you went into your eye doctor and he gave you a prescription that fixed half the problem. Um, that's really what we're doing with a lot of our patients and, we've been, and it's because we've been limited by the technology that's available to them. Uh, of course, we've known the challenge with, it, with, with being able to accomplish those goals. But if you look at uh, some of the research that does exist uh, on some of the passive devices, we know that amputees compensate both in biomechanics because of lack of range of motion, as well as they have a larger energy consumption when they use these devices. And that's largely due to the fact that passive devices can only restore or give them back about half of the mechanical energy that they need to walk as compared to an able body walker. And so I think we've got a... So if we take a look here, what you're looking at here is the metabolic cost for a group of amputees control, compared to a control group. And we're looking at their velocity in miles per hour compared to the metabolic cost. So the normals are the red lines. Uh, in this particular study, they were looking at the flex foot, uh, which is in the uh, lighter sort of uh, red there. And then, of course, the conventional foot, which is typically a satch foot in most of these studies, uh, is the blue. And so what's interesting is that we see this normal gap, right? We expect to see this metabolic gap between the able-bodied control group and the amputees, but what surprised I think a lot of practitioners is that we really don't see the carbon blade differentiate itself until the higher walking speeds. And so what that would suggest, and in some terms that's not very surprising because by the end of the day these devices are springs. The more you load a spring, the more energy it conserves, the more energy it gives back. So Logically, at a, at a slower walking speed, they're not going to get quite as much return as they would at a higher walking speed. The other thing we know about amputees is that once they have an amputation, their self-selected walking speed decreases. It's the body's natural compensation to deal with the fact that they have a higher energy cost walking with the prosthesis. So for a lot of the individuals, to, for them to really benefit, we need them walking at these higher walking velocities, but yet they're down here, particularly with the diabetic geriatric population. So we have this challenge. and. You know, how do we get back the, sorry, this video we already recognize isn't, isn't running, so that's okay. Um, but how do we get back to these normal biomechanical characteristics? We know typically we're going to see 10 to 15 degrees of dorsiflexion, uh, up to 15 degrees of plantar flexion in late stents. Uh, we know that the primary muscle groups involved are the gastroc, the soleus, the anterior tibialis, of course the Achilles tendon, the strongest tendon in the body, and it's that lower uh, there's lower bullets where we've had the real challenge in restoring that energy return uh, that passive or quasi-passive devices cannot do. So that's our philosophy, is that with Biome, we're trying to make this transition from traditional prosthetics that sort of replicate that bone structure to what we define as personal bionics that emulate muscle and tendon. And the reason we throw that word personal in there is that, as we'll discuss, um, as you've seen in some of the other devices, uh, we allow the practitioner to very easily fine-tune the individual so that they can match the gait characteristics, energy requirements um, for that particular patient through a tuning application. So to give you a brief overview of the technology, it's really, a, a lot of people are very interested to know, well, how, how do you produce that kind of power? Because uh, as Jason alluded to in the CFI study, what they actually found with some of those participants was that uh, the peak power moment with Biome was actually higher than their contralateral side or their sound side, and also higher than even compared to the able body control group. Uh, that was obviously a tuning issue, which I'll speak to in, in a couple of slides. But a lot of people are interested, how do you produce that amount of powered response? And so it's a three-component system, and it's basically made up of a linear actuator, which you see here, an AC brushless motor, and then the third component is an elastic series spring. And so what you've got is the motor driving the linear actuator. You can kind of think it dur as during stance phase, the ankle is loading up, that linear actuator is loading up. At the same time, it's compressing the series spring. And so in late stance, when the microprocessor, it's reading torque throughout the step. So it's 
reading the relative torque about the ankle axis throughout stents. The moment that torque level drops, it has its measurement, and it knows how much power propulsion to respond with at that point. So the amount of power response is dependent upon the, asian, the patient's walking velocity and the type of terrain that they're walking on. Uh, so for example, when I walk slow, I get a small amount of power. If I speed up, I get a larger amount of power. If I start to climb hills, stairs, ramps, those sorts of things, I get an even more increased amount of power. Uh, it's important to know that it reacts independently of each step, so it essentially resets. Uh, it doesn't try to follow algorithms, that sort of thing. It's looking at the torque of each step and responds independently to that with each step, because that's important, because if we're really going to try to replicate those spinal reflexes of an able-bodied walker, that's the sort of response we have to have from a prosthetic device as well. So I mentioned before that alluded to Jason's comment about, and, and this even goes along to where some of their antidotes to, well, we didn't quite see total consistency even between some of the gait characteristics and whatnot. And so we certainly have learned over time that the tuning is absolutely crucial with this device. It's one thing to be able to make a device that can replicate uh, bone and muscle and tendon. It's quite another to get it to behave in a uh, biomechanical manner in that you're getting that plantar flexion at the appropriate amount of time at initial contact. It's uh, the timing of the rollover is appropriate. Uh, how hard it pushes in late stance and when in late stance it pushes in that particular stance is very important. And so as I mentioned before, we have a tuning application that allows the practitioner to control those parameters. So you have complete control over the timing or the uh, that eccentric contraction at initial contact. You have control over the amount of power in late stance. And then you also have a timing component that allows you to uh, determine when that, that power plantar flexion in late stance will occur. And now what, what we've moved to next is to try to take it one step further. Uh, and there's two purposes that we've um, we've launched this dashboard concept. So what I'd like to point out is that what we can measure here is once you feel like you have your patient tuned appropriately, uh, what we do right now is we do a lot of these fittings with our practitioners and this type of application will move into our current application on the tablets, is that you'll be able to run what we call a biomimetic dashboard. And so the patient will walk a series of steps throughout all their, their walking speeds, slow, medium, and fast. And then what you'll see here is actual plots. So these blobs of outputs, or these dark circles, are a grouping of steps. So this would be about 30 steps at slow speed, 30 steps at self-selected, 30 steps at very fast speed. And so what you're seeing here is we're actually comparing data as it pertains to the network, and this is all in relation to ankle and comparing it to an anatomical ankle. So we compare network, the angle, so that's how much the ankle actually opens up in late stance when it plantar flexes, peak power for each one of those steps, and then of when the timing occurs or when that powered plantar flexion occurs in late stance. And what this allows you to do is, one, is comparing it against normative measures, right? So you can, uh, this is actual documentation that we can give you printouts on that you can put in the patient's chart to show that you essentially normalized function for this patient as it pertains to these parameters. Uh, we can also do similar uh, reports of uh, once they're out in the field that we can get back from the ankles, such as step count, the types of terrain they've been on. Uh, all of these things are, are data that you can get back as um, evidence that the patient, one, is using the device, how much they're using the device, and then, of course, that you've established that you've been able to tune it and that this technology behaves in a normative manner. And what you get from that is some incredible performance in even extreme situations. So not, not too many bilaterals would be able to descend a 45-degree slope uh, you see the, the amount of compensation there, so he's getting up to 24 degrees of plantar flexion as he descends, and then he's getting a considerable amount, up to about 750 watts of power uh, per step if needed as he climbs the hill. So there again, you can see immediately first step compensation to the terrain until it finds the ground, pushes him out of that divot, and then as he turns around, he still has the energy to climb that same sort of grade. So there's several things in, in, in leading sort of into the research and some of the data that's out there is 
first that what we've seen from, uh, Jason alluded to the Royal Society paper that was launched. Uh, some of the key findings in that was in the, something we continue to see across the board with our fittings in the field is that most users, they do experience some sort of metabolic reduction. Uh, in the Royal Society, that group, in fact, uh, the metabolic cost was normalized as compared to the able body control group, with, which was a huge feat. The second thing that we've consistently seen is that individual self-selected walking speed instantly increases in most cases. This, this almost happens from their initial steps once they uh, have just a small amount of time to get acclimated to the device. Uh, that, of course, uh, means they're walking more efficiently. They tend to have better balance because uh, it's funny as when we do these dashboards and we ask them to walk slow, they have a harder time walking slow than they do now at their self-selected walking speed because, again, that center of mass is being carried a little bit more fluently over. We tend to see their base of support decrease in a lot of times. Uh, the power plantar flexion in late stance uh, inherently encourages knee flexion, which in turn inherently encourages transverse rotation of the pelvis. Uh, we know that's particularly important for transfemorals, which uh, we've moved into this past year as well as far as our fittings. And there may also be data now, this, and this is an area that we're looking strongly into now, is to reduce the collision work on the co contralateral knee. So the one thing, if you read that Royal Society paper, one of the other findings from that was uh, they really focused on the transitional work when the, when the biome was the trailing leg and their intact side was the lead leg, uh, because we're storing a lot of that energy return, the lead leg is doing less work, uh, there's potentially less forces on the knee. We know that amputees over time inherently have a higher rate of low back pain, uh, osteoarthritis in their knee and hip, uh, particularly their sound side knee and hip. They actually have a higher prevalence in that as compared to able body walkers who may develop uh, the same sort of comorbidity over time. And so there is a strong implication that uh, increased power in late stance may reduce those uh, external adduction moments about the knee. So this is just a graphic to show. This is actually from the Royal Society paper. So again, what you're looking at here is the amputee group in their passive device uh, as compared to this red, the darker red line, which is the able body control group. And then this lighter gray line is what you're going to see is the same amputee population after they were fit and acclimated to biome. This was the reduction in metabolic cost that they experienced uh, in that Royal Society publication. This was just a case series that was recently done at MIT to sort of complement that EAM discussion that I was talking about. So here we're just looking at the ground reaction forces. Uh, this, it's a little bit difficult to see, but this lighter, uh, the gray graph is the amputees on their carbon device. Uh, the darker line is going to be them on biome. So what we're seeing here with the, when we're looking at the ground reaction force, the actual amount of pressure on their sound side uh, when it's the leading leg, and then of course the EAM, the external adduction moment, and then that's, this is really sort of the uh, compelling part on each of them, especially you, subject two, where you see this huge reduction on the EAM. Um, and again, where we see variance in this area, both with metabolic cost, um, uh, mechanics, gate mechanics, and the EAM, we found largely has to do with tuning. Uh, once, if that is really dialed in correctly, this is when you really start to see a lot of these benefits to the user. So just real quickly, a couple more slides here. Uh, user pro profile, so we are fitting transtibial and transfemoral users. And functional level, I would say low or moderately active lower extremity amputees. So basically their primary function is walking every day. If you've, uh, as Jason alluded to and in his talk, uh, we initially launched in the DOD. That was a very high level, sort of high K3, K4 type users. And now that we've started to integrate more into the VA system, we're finding that those users in the VA who represent that older population certainly are not only benefiting more from the device, but they're accepting the device with the most higher rate as well. So we feel like that that's the, the demographic that we're going to be gravitating towards in the future. Your maximum weight is 250 pounds. Available foot size is 25 to 30. You do need 8 and 5 eighths inches clearance to fit the device. Um, compliance, basically, you know, that was kind of brought up earlier. Uh, really only some of the um, concerns that some patients or practitioners may have is the fact that there is noise associated with the dry belts inside. Uh, a lot of practitioners feel this device in their hand and they get concerned about the weight. It is five pounds. Uh, as a user, I can only speak to you is to say, uh, sort of in lieu of what Jack was saying before at the end of his talk, was that as a practitioner, and I'm a practitioner 
I'm also a user, is don't have preconceived notions of this device. Don't make decisions for your patients based off the fact you think it's too heavy, too noisy for them. Uh, we've had tons of patients who I would have thought would have never even uh, tried the device because of those concerns, uh, and they wind up accepting the device because of the function that it restores for them. Uh, so we've seen this many times before that they start to overlook uh, some of these things based purely off of what the device does for them. Contraindications would obviously be it's not waterproof, uh, so if they're in some sort of occupation where it puts the ankle at risk to be submerged in water, uh, very dirty device uh, environments, you know, that sort of thing are obviously a concern. Um, and of course, you know, if you have more questions about that, come by our booth, talk to me later, and we can discuss. So to wrap things up, uh, it is the only device that adequately replaces loss, the loss function of muscle and tendon. Uh, research and data shows that it's uh, shown to normalize metabolic cost and also improving mechanics of walking gait. And it's the only device that actually compares normative parameters uh, to the able body. So that again referring to the dashboards um, and how it compares to normative function of an anatomical ankle. And so I'll open it up for any questions if you guys have it. Thank you. All right, thanks. I want to thank you all for your patience and hanging in here. Um, I think you'll take a lot home uh, learning the features and benefits that our manufacturer representatives presented. I think that's really important to know as clinicians and the different um, you know, advantages that each microprocessor foot ankle mechanism provides over others. Um, but most likely, uh, the information that you guys have gotten so far it probably hasn't made it clear in your mind which microprocessor foot ankle mechanism you want to use on that patient that you're thinking about that you are evaluating next week. So, and it's a difficult topic. So uh, my presentation comes at the end. Uh, I'm going to cut out a lot of the fluff, uh, what little there was, and I won't make uh, any lame jokes. So it'll go by quick. Um, you're saying my jokes were lame? Yes. <laughs> Great. So um, again, my name is Brian Califf. I'm a certified prosthetist with Ability Prosthetics and Orthotics. And uh, in selecting and evaluating the most appropriate uh, microprocessor foot ankle mechanisms, this is really a feasible clinician approach that we're going to talk about. So um, I'm not a manufacturer. I'm not an institutional researcher. Um, I manage a small uh, clinic. And it's a very messy schedule. Um, but I try to find, find the time to help learn about foot ankle mechanisms to treat my patients most appropriately. So there's a huge need uh, for clinicians to step up in our field and um, uh, put these new technologies through the ringer. So microprocessors in, in all aspects of, of healthcare are becoming increasingly viable. Um, we had some, some great new technologies presented today and some we're familiar with. Uh, but at the same time, a pressure from third party payers uh, and scrutiny is increasing. So those are, are very opposing trends. It looks a lot like a um, supply and demand uh, kind of a curve. So we have a need to evaluate and document the clinical significance or the clinical benefit of the interventions that we provide. That's, I mean, the, the calling card of outcomes based clinical practice. Um, but the limiting factor that I've found is that there's a lack of information and a lack of, inf uh, of use of information gathering tools uh, in the clinical setting to help guide decision making process. So as clinicians, it's our responsibility to translate the patient perceived benefits from these interventions, document that, um, and use those to guide our, our, our treatment choices. So. Um, in my own practice, um, I'm excited to have these new technologies because I think that our patients uh, in performance can be improved. The performance of these devices are, are far, far outweigh uh, some of the older uh, prosthetic foot technologies. Um, but I think that our capabilities and our approaches as clinicians, uh, we also need to outperform our previous selves when we, come in, when we encounter this level of technology. So. Um, Ability has a collection of 11 uh, multi-region multi practices, and we've all actually adopted an outcomes-based approach um, for treating every individual amputee we see. 
And loosely, it basically consists of three things. Each patient presents an, uh, you know, unique, and so the tools we use are unique as well. Um, but it's a performance outcome measure, something the patient usually does during the appointment that we record uh, based on time or distance. And, and you might be familiar with some of these. A patient reported outcome measure is uh, a survey, and it's very quick to administer, but uh, we have a toolbox that we rely on of uh, validated patient report surveys. Um, so that's important to be able to compare to normative data uh, presented in, in literature. And then um, recently, we've, we've gained access to instrumented gait analysis. Um, my gate, uh, gate room is actually the hallway outside of my office. It's carpeted and it has two pieces of tape on it. But it's extremely useful to me and my patients. So if you're not familiar with uh, outcome measures, a good place to start. There's a, a publication in 2009, Academy Today, by Phil Stevens, and it had a great overview. Otherwise, tomorrow uh, it'll be finished on time, I promise. Um, the Outcome Research Committee uh, has a session on patient reported outcome measures that I highly recommend. And um, whatever I skip over today, I'll actually uh, catch up on tomorrow at that time. So. Um, we learned a lot about the features and benefits. I realize that we can't read this graph, but what I wanted to just show is there are some outliers and some, um, some specifications that help us um, eliminate choices when we're selecting patients. I know the first one I always look at is, is weight limit. That, 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 that kind of chops out half the options for most of my patients. Um, but it, you, know, you need to be familiar with those, and I think you learned a lot about them today. Um, if I have any of those wrong, the manufacturers, I'm sure, will let me know after the presentation. Um, but I wanted to present on two, two approaches uh, that I've relied on in the past when encountering and, and utilizing a new foot ankle mechanism that I'm not familiar with, that I didn't gain training on in, in schooling and through residency, um, and a patient that was really interested in them. So uh, the first case, uh, what's well, the case? It's an approach. Um, uh, it came to use, we had a patient, uh, fit in Chicago, Midwest, it's really flat, uh, but she lived half the year in San Francisco, and when she came back to us, she really complained that, that um, she was limited in her mobility. Um, and we didn't understand that, and she showed us a picture of her home, which actually doesn't look like that. It looks like this, and her street is, is an extreme slope. So sh she was severely disabled, and, and her mobility was limited because of the device that we provided to her in Chicago. Um, so we really wanted to address this. Um, and at the time, there was, a, there was two um, passive hydraulic ankle foot mechanisms on the market that we decided to trial. We ordered the trial units from the manufacturers, and we brought the patient in, scheduled her for a two-hour appointment. Uh, this wasn't a research study. Um, it, we did do a, a type of a protocol, um, but I make these lists uh, before I see any patient, whether we're, uh, it's just a follow-up or um, I like to keep myself on track. So um, basically what we were going to do is assemble and align the feet, allow the patient to walk on even terrain and then on a the ramp, and during those walking trials we were going to capture the socket loading and uh, compare and contrast that and try to actually learn a little bit about the alignment and dynamic features of these ankles. Uh, then at the end of e using each foot, we allowed the patient or asked the patient to fill out a survey um, and compare the results. So again, it didn't take a lot of time. It was really easy and everything was uh, readily available in our clinic. Um, if you're not familiar with recording loads on the socket, um, we, the, the, the unit that we used was the OrthoCare's uh, smart pyramid and compass unit, and there's, a, there's some references here, and if you want, I can share the references at the end, uh, but if you're more interested in that, it's a much, much lengthier discussion, but um, you can think about the loads on the socket, especially in the sagittal plane, is the force couple we're familiar with um, at heel, heel strike or initial contact, you have posterior, proximal, anterior, distal, I mean, this is, you know, basic biomechanics, so. The, the, the survey that I was using at the time was really short, but I'll point out, it just asked the patients uh, their perceived disability uh, and their mobility in, in these uh, activities. So it took them 30 seconds to fill out. So um, I'm going to keep running through these. I apologize if anybody gets uh, epileptic seizures from flashing lights. Um, so 
All right, my job is a, in this was to try to interpret the patient's feedback and uh, record an objective uh, difference between the two components. Um, so the patient described that, that she was more confident on the slope. Uh, she was able to walk upstairs. And, and in comparison, she described a, the flex foot type foot, like walking with a leg in a bucket. Um, so she wasn't going to go back to a, a traditional type flex foot type foot. Uh, my observations and uh, observational gait analysis, I saw that the foot was flatter on the ramp, you know, more contact with the ground. Um, and uh, I wouldn't describe it as a smooth motion of the foot. That's a, a, a term that bothers me. Uh, but there was an appropriate progression of the tibia from initial contact uh, to late stance as the patient descended the ramp. So I'm going to skip through, I think, most of the uh, or touch, touch briefly on some of the graphics, um, but I actually extrapolate the, or export the data uh, from the Compass unit to, into Excel to do a little bit more in-depth data analysis. Um, but this is a graph of the sagittal plane torques at the bottom of the socket as the patient descended the slope. And uh, in the cooler colors is uh, when the patient was using the echelon foot. And in the warmer colors is when the patient was using a, uh, a motion rotary hydraulic foot. Um, so just generally, you can see that the, the functionality and the loads in the socket, they were different. And specifically, um, one thing that I looked at was um, the rate or how fast uh, the patient's heel moment to toe moment changed. And uh, if I average those over several steps, um, I found that the motion foot, it was decreased by half. So the patient perceived that uh, the motion foot, it felt less like she was walking in a bucket. And what we were able to record was that the, the rate of change uh, in that sagittal plane torque was half. Um, so for me, that, that uh, corroborated what we were observing, what the patient was, was uh, reporting. And if you took a look at the surveys, again, I'm just going to focus on uh, the, what the patient perceived in her uh, disability in walking down hills. A higher number uh, represented um, a higher perceived disability, and a lower number, uh, for instance, zero would be like, like normal walking. So with the, the flex foot type foot, severely disabled was her perception. And then with the different feet, uh, she was improved. And it was very clear which one we were going to decide to fit with, um, which was the motion foot. So um, so that was on walking on, uh, on severe slopes with a hydraulic ankle. Uh, another approach that I've used recently um, was in transitioning a patient from their temporary prosthesis to a definitive prosthesis. And this ex specific example, the temporary prosthesis, um, we evaluated the patient to be a K2 level ambulator and fit them with an appropriate foot for, for that K level. And then when we reevaluated the patient when it was time for the definitive, we improved or increased their K level. And uh, so I know right now in our field um, that that K2, K3 difference is, is hugely important. And so this was the approach that I used to make sure and document that the tick up and component cost also uh, came along with some benefits to the patient. So. The quick approach that I use in my clinic, um, it was very similar. We used a performance outcome measure. We used the 10 meter timed walk test, two pieces of tape and a stopwatch. Um, then we also had access to an accelerometer. And this type of technology is a wearable sensor that's really um, becoming readily available because uh, cell phones have made that a lot cheaper. And there's actually some approaches uh, with iPhones where you basically put it on a belt on, on the patient and you can output the accelerometer data. So, um, and then I, I now use a, a patient reported questionnaire called uh, the PEQMS or the Prosthesis Evaluation Questionnaire Mobility Scale. So, and really this, this whole uh, assessment approach took about five minutes with each foot. I mean, as fast as the patient could walk up and down my hallway, I was pretty much done. Um, so a little bit about the G-Walk sensor. Um, it is about as big as this remote, and it goes on a belt on the patient's uh, lower back. Um, there has been some recent publications that compare that to gait analysis data, but it basically um, it records the accelerations and the rotations at the center of mass, which is important. So when I'm training amputees initially with their prosthesis for gait, um, there's a few things that I kind of systematically concentrate on. One is uh, increasing the patient's uh, weight acceptance on the prosthesis. 
Uh, once they've achieved that, then I try to encourage symmetric step length between right and left. Um, and then we work on narrowing their base of support and reducing um, any lateral trunk bending that we see. And so once they've made it that far, then my physical therapists take over and uh, I'm on to the next patient. So, um, but I use this actually to help and make sure that the, the new prosthetic foot um, helped with some of those gait deviations. So some of the unsolicited patient feedback, again, it's my job as the clinician to interpret these to ensure that the prosthetic component is appropriate for them and also to document this in my clinical notes. So the patient felt that the new microprocessor ankle was more flexible, it had more motion, and it moves with me. And uh, that's, that's super, that's great, but it, it doesn't have a whole lot of bite in my clinical notes. So even the patient's wife noticed the patient, the patient's gait was improved. So maybe she should do my gait analysis, I don't know. Um, the old foot, she felt, uh, he felt like it was like walking on a stiff board and I would agree. My observational gait analysis with the old K2 type foot, the patient exhibited a, a, a heavy um, prosthetic side, you know, initial contact. Um, and it just, it just looked painful in comparison to walking with the microprocessor ankle. So the other thing that I observed was the patient's base of support reduced with the microprocessor ankle. So. Maybe that or he was just finally listening to me coaching him, I'm not sure. Um, the next two slides are really busy, um, but I'm, only, I'm gonna point out two things. In the time walk test, I actually noticed that the patient um, walked slower with the microprocessor ankle. And so that's fine with me. He can walk into self-selected walking speed. So. But the prosthesis evaluation questionnaire uh, in the mobility section, in the gray are all the areas that the patient perceived improvement in his uh, ambulatory function. And the overall score improved from a 23 to a 30. And this is what we would expect when the patient uh, transitions from a K2 foot to K3 foot. Um, but it took me no time to administer this and record it in the chart because the patient filled it out in a lobby. Uh, but it has you know, a huge impact on the quality of documentation that I have to support that difference in components. So temporal spatial parameters, these all come automatically out of the G-Walk sensor. Um, it's kind of hard to look at because there are so many numbers. Um, but if I compare this step length between the right and the left side, um, I think I have it reviewed at the end, but the, the right left step length symmetry improved with the microprocessor foot. So again, another thing that I'm trying to uh, improve in my uh, patients as they progress with their prosthesis. Um, it also allows you to look at the uh, acceleration of the center of mass, and this is in the coronal plane, so forward and, and backward or uh, braking and uh, propulsion as the patient walks. But the K2 type foot, we saw much uh, higher peaks um, in the red on the left graph, um, which show that basically the patient had to, uh, when they're walking with that, that lower functioning foot, um, they had a lot of more braking forces and then had to actually add in more of a force to achieve that self-selected walking speed um, and late stance. So there was much more oscillation and, and, the, and change in the acceleration. So, And we saw it was much smoother and the, the, the peak accelerations on the stance phase and the, in, on the prosthesis were lower with the microprocessor ankle. So. Again, some of my observational gait analysis, that they, they were um, basically supported uh, with the G-Walk data and graphs. Um, important for me was reducing this lateral trunk bending the patient exhibited on the prosthetic side. Um, so I observed this and then also uh, I was able to document it with the curves. On the left, you see this large dip in the blue section in the negative, and that the peak lateral flexion on the prosthetic side was 3.3 degrees with the Avalon, and uh, when the patient walked with the Elan, it was reduced to uh, 2.8 degrees. So it's something I observed and something that I uh, supported uh, with objective data. Again, the rotation, the pelvic rotation that I'm trying to encourage um, when switching to the microprocessor ankle, the patient increased their total range of motion of their pelvis in the transverse plane. So, and that's a, a determinant of gait that, that is um, you know, one of the last ones for me to focus on, but I was glad to see it was improved with a, a higher functioning foot. So. 
you know. In summary, the information that I got from literally about four extra minutes uh, of um, evaluation for this patient um, was the, you know, the prosthesis evaluation questionnaire absolutely showed um, that the patient's mobility was improved and uh, we had an improvement in uh, symmetry between step lengths, right and left side, and some of the gait deviations uh, were reduced. So. Um, so in summary, you know, these two, they're very feasible uh, uh, clinical approaches. They, they don't take much time, and it really doesn't, um, you know, take that much skill to interpret this data. We're already, um, or should be, experts in gait analysis and observational gait analysis, and this really um, improves our skill level in that. So, um, so really what, you know, what we're trying to do in our practices is uh, to use outcomes-based protocols and approaches to advance the field of prosthetics uh, from an art form to a state of the art. So, and I think you've seen this with the advancements in our componentry, and uh, it's time for our clinical practices uh, to catch up. So, with that, there's uh, my references slides, and I thank you again for your patience and hanging in there. And uh, I know it's lunchtime, so I hope you guys had, you know, at least received some information to, to chew on, so. <laughs> Thanks, that's great. Okay, well, thanks for hanging in. We have one question, quick question. Step up to the microphone, please. What would be the two most, if you were going to do two essential tests to justify going to a different K level, what would they be? It, it definitely depends on the patient and, and their presentation. Um, but. Um, I'll, I'll suggest that you actually do come tomorrow to the Outcome Research Committee's uh, session. Um, but um, probably in, in my clinical notes, 60 to 70 percent of my medical justification is our normal examination and patients' comorbidities and their history, their motivation. Uh, but the objective data and the quantitative data that we record is, is also very important. And so we use the amputee mobility predictor uh, on every single patient. And um, so we can use that to justify our K-level assessment. And it actually improves our ability to identify weaknesses that patients have that we can recommend in therapy. So um, that's one of them. But there's, there's a lot of answers that can fill in the gaps. Um, so that's really the only validated 2K-level test, right, the AMPRO? Uh, correct, yeah. So, but the, the timed up and go test is also, is always very useful if you can show a, a difference as we saw here. So, yeah. great. Well, thanks.